Your eyes and your vision are under attack, damaging blue light from the sun. Your phone, your computer, your tablet, even light bulbs and car headlights is constantly bombarding you. The good news is our eyes actually already have a line of defense to counter the effects of blue light. This defense is made up of three pigments called carotenoids. MacU Health with Micromycel, the only supplement with the exclusive patent on all three macular carotenoids and Micromycel technology. Do your patients know what presbyopia is? There are people who are afraid of the press. Have you talked to your patients about multifocal contact lenses? I've heard the bifocal, but not right, multifocal. Exactly. Not multifocal. Do you need help with your multifocal strategy? Learn more at the conclusion of this episode. The All Eyes Visual VRP is a portable vision testing platform that includes visual fields, acuity, color vision testing, pupillometry, and extraocular motility. The visual leverages virtual reality, artificial intelligence, and augmented technologies to enable eye care providers to test for and monitor common eye diseases. Visit alleyes.com for more information. With more screen usage and indoor time, myopia, also known as nearsightedness, is increasing and getting worse in children. Now, certified eye doctors can prescribe my sight one day, the first and only FDA-approved soft contact lens to slow myopia progression in age-appropriate children. Visit coopervision.com to find a Brilliant Futures certified eye doctor near you. Welcome to Open Your Eyes Radio. Please listen as I discuss the newest information in the world of health, nutrition, and sports every Saturday morning, 9 a.m. Central Time on AM 1280 of The Patriot. Also, please share your thoughts by emailing me at drkerrygelb at gmail.com. That's D-R-K-E-R-R-Y-G-E-L-B at gmail.com. At the end of the Civil War in 1865, chronic disease such as cardiovascular disease, stroke, diabetes, blindness from macular degeneration, Alzheimer's, obesity, and cancers were practically unheard of. Today's guest, Dr. Chris Kenobi, MD, has spent many years researching why chronic disease has exploded in the U.S. and other modern societies. Dr. Kenobi shares his prolific work in his amazing new book, The Ancestral Diet Revolution, How Vegetable Oils and Processed Foods Destroy Our Health and How to Recover. Dr. Kenobi is a physician, ophthalmologist, nutrition researcher, public scientist, and speaker. Dr. Kenobi is the founder and director of both the Ancestral Health Foundation and Cure AMD Foundation. Chris, thank you for joining me today. Thanks, Kerry. It's, it's an honor and pleasure to be here. I appreciate it. You know, Chris, I've been following your work for many years. I initially found you on the internet talking about macular degeneration and, and you've spoken at our All Docs conference a couple of times and of course a fan favorite. And you know, this book, you know, has over 1300 references. Why did you write the book? Well, um, because I really didn't believe that there was anything else in the literature that is like this. And it occurred to me, Carrie, um, after I really began to connect vegetable oils so strongly with age-related macular degeneration way back in uh, 2013, 14, and 15. Um, and, and then I went public with that in 2016, began to write and speak, present on, on that. And by 2018 and 2019, uh, it just, as I said, it occurred to me that there was really very little discussion in the scientific literature or, um, uh, you know, in presentations and so forth uh, about the dangers of vegetable oils. And um, I, I had really been uh, deeply invested in that research for quite a while, even by that point. So I went public with that uh, initially at the Ancestral Health Symposium 2019 was really my first presentation to connect vegetable oils to all of this chronic disease. So I'd been, I'd been doing it before. I'm not, I'm saying that 
we'll get into the, the weeds a little bit. I'm not saying that, th that everything is just about vegetable oils. It's about processed foods and vegetable oils. And I'll, I'll say right now, I, I, I always maintain uh, that processed foods are primarily refined flours, refined sugars, vegetable oils, and trans fats. That's basic. It's those four components. And those are the problem. But of those, Carrie, what I see over and over and over is that it is the, the highly polyunsaturated vegetable oils that are by far and away the biggest player in all of this chronic disease. All those diseases you just mentioned at the beginning here. You know, when I went over my introduction from 1865 to now and the increase of these chronic diseases, the first thing people are going to say, well, people are living longer now, so that's why they're getting chronic disease. Can you dispel that myth? Absolutely. Um, so uh, many people um, very mistakenly believe that you know, they look at a, a longevity uh, or a lifespan uh, graph or chart, and they'll say, well, in 1900, the average American died at 49.6 years or what, I think it's, that's what it is, something like that. And they'll say, so people were just dropping dead by, you know, they're by 45 and 50. Um, and uh, therefore they didn't grow old enough to develop coronary heart disease and all these cancers and diabetes and less obesity and those and macular degeneration, all these, these disorders. And the reality is, is that if you look at every single population, every historical book there is, you will never, ever, ever find a population where people were growing old and dying at age 50. The, mis the mistake in this thinking comes from the fact that, um, in, in, in most of history, children had a very high death rate, um, and that, that came from uh, mostly uh, infectious diseases uh, uh, and trauma, but the, and, and even predation if you look at hunter-gatherers. So, so um, but for example, in the year 1800, 43.3% of the world's children did not survive to see their fifth birthday. And in 1900, it wasn't much better. In, in the year 1900, 36.2% of children did not live to see their fifth birthday. Uh, and in 1900, um, the, uh, th there was a, about 4% of women died in childbirth. So it was one to one and a half percent per birth. And the average woman gave, I think it was six, five or six births. So there, there was about 4% of women dying in childbirth. So if you put those together, you, you have an extremely high percentage of the population that's dying at an early age. Um, and so I, I use the example, I say that, you know, if you took a population of three, um, if a man who lived to age 80 and his wife who lived to age 70 and their only child died um, in infancy, the, the total life lived for those that population of three is 150 years divided by three and that's 50. And that's what was happening. And so and it, it, it and so it's if you look at all of the, the, the data, you'll see, and, there, and I've posted much of this before, and it's, this is in the book, but you can look at lifespans and you can see that, in fact, people did live as long in the, in the 19th century, as long as they survived childhood. In fact, they, in, in many, in, in some ways, they may have lived uh, longer, but they certainly lived about as long as we do now in their upper 70s on average if they survive childhood and this is the exact same thing we see in hunter-gatherer populations so Gervin and Kaplan uh, published a paper on that a um, number of years ago and they showed that hunter-gatherers if uh, uh, which th this is the most brutal life there is to live out in the in the open without you know without uh uh, shelter even, um, they lived to an average, a, a modal 
age of death of, of 72. So this is if they survive childhood. Uh, and, uh, and the span was much higher. So, so in, in other words, in, in all of history, people have always lived long if they survived childhood. So how many parts of the world are the people living as hunter-gatherers? Is that common or is that getting less and less as we as the world is becoming more westernized? Oh yes, there's very few populations that are that are truly hunter-gatherers today. Um, you know, I, I I I don't know if I should try to go through and name them. I wouldn't do a very good job of that, Carrie, but um yeah, there's there's very very few populations left on the planet that are truly completely um ancestral i mean i'll give you some examples so the so the the maasai uh warriors of kenyan tanzania uh still living ancestral the hadza of kenya um there are some there are, you know possibly uh some of the papua new guineans um the ashe of paraguay uh, there are some uh, Mongolian populations. There's a few scattered populations around the world, but there's not really very many that are still complete living completely ancestral lives. Meaning they're they're not they haven't westernized their diets and they're not you know they're 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 not consuming processed foods. The book a lot is on the book is on vegetable oils and seed oils. Is there a difference between vegetable oils and seed oils? And if you could explain the difference. Sure, Carrie. So, so uh, vegetable oils really is all of the oils that, that, you know, originated from some type of plant source. And so those are, those really are um, the, um, you know, seed oils, the tropical oils and the fruit oils. And so the uh, the one, the oils, let me just say this, that the oils that are very high in omega-6 linoleic acid, which is what, uh, what I would submit to you is driving all of this chronic disease because they're highly, they're, they're pro-inflammatory, uh, pro-oxidative, toxic and nutrient deficient. Those oils are, and I'll just name them, um, soybean, corn, canola, cottonseed, rapeseed, grapeseed, sunflower, safflower, rice bran, uh, sesame, and peanut oil. So those are the high, the highly polyunsaturated oils. And then you have the tropical oils, which is primarily coconut, palm, and palm kernel. It's almost exclusively those. And then you have the fruit oils, which is really olive oil and av avocado oil. And um, so all of those are, they're, they're very different, but in a nutshell, it is the seed oils, the big group that I named first that has, this has overtaken the added fats in the diet since the 1860s. Um, and, uh, and these oils have largely supplanted and replaced the, the traditional animal fats, lard, butter, and beef tallow. And a, as that's happened, we've accumulated omega-6 in our body fat, and this drives all of this chronic disease. So tell me what the omega-6, what the seed oils are doing to the body. Uh, how, is it, how is it becoming dangerous inside our body? Right, so, so when, you, when you consume omega-6 uh, fat, so again, the fats are broken down into saturated fats, monounsaturated fats, and polyunsaturated fats. And the polyunsaturated fats are the, um, the, the or PUFAs. These are the omega-6 and omega-3. And of the omega-6, it is uh, what, what is in our diet is about 90% omega-6 linoleic acid, or LA. And when... When we should consume those in very small quantities. So I, I, I have shown that ancestrally living populations who wouldn't, of course, wouldn't have any, they wouldn't have any vegetable oils at all, but they certainly wouldn't have any seed oils. Um, well, I should, let me rephrase that. They don't have any seed oils, okay? Some do have some, some vegetable oils, but uh, like coconut or palm kernel oil uh, or olive oil, for example, but they don't have seed oils which are the highly 
polyunsaturated omega-6 rich oils. So those oils, they accumulate in our body fat is what they do, and they, which means that then they accumulate in our cell, cell membranes and in our mitochondrial membranes. And as they accumulate, they set us up um, to, as I mentioned before, in a, in a biological milieu that is pro-oxidative, pro-inflammatory, toxic, and nutrient deficient. We could talk about a, a little bit about each one of those if you want to, but yes. anyway, that, that's, the, that's the basic mechanisms. Let's start with canola oil. What does canola stand for? And people think, so, well, canola is a good oil, you know, uh, as good as olive oil. But if you could explain how much linole LA, uh, linoleic acid is actually in canola oil, and, how, and if canola oil is actually as dangerous as it appears to be. Right. So canola oil uh, stands for uh, Canadian um, low, uh, low acid, I, I believe is the way it is, um, the way they put that together, because canola oil comes from the rapeseed plant. And the rapeseed plant was very high in uh, a type of fatty acid called erucic acid. And that erucic acid was found to be um, so incredibly dangerous, it would kill animals and, and and determined to be very dangerous for humans um, and so what they did was they they um, hybridized this plant repeatedly until they uh, until they created a version that was low erucic acid and, and that and that was done primarily in Canada or at least that's where they popularized it and so Canada grows most of the world's rapeseed and they produce, the, I, I think, the bulk of the canola oil. But canola oil is not a healthy oil. Um, it is about 20 or 21% omega-6 linoleic acid. And that is far too high. Now, let me compare that to so that traditional animal fats like butter, uh, lard, and beef tallow, these will all run about one and a half to two and a half, possibly 3% omega-6 linoleic acid if the animals are traditionally raised. And we can get into the, the details about that. But the seed oils, they, as I mentioned, all those oils, soybean, corn, canola, cottonseed, rapeseed, grapeseed, sunflower, safflower, all of these oils, they run from about 20% up to 78% omega-6 linoleic acid. So safflower, for example, is about 78% omega-6 linoleic acid. Um, soybean oil is around 54 to 56% omega-6 linoleic acid. And again, as I mentioned, canola is around 20%. So you can see they run extremely high levels of omega-6. And again, when you consume those oils on a regular basis, they will begin to accumulate in your body fat and your body fat will begin to reflect as a percentage, the types of fatty acids that are in your diet. And so this is how we get to very high levels of omega-6 in our body fat. Now, how does the LA, the linoleic acid that's coming from these oils, cause cancer, cardiovascular disease, blood clotting, obesity? What ha how does it change within the body to cause that? Well, so I, I, I think it goes back to those four mechanisms uh, for, for one thing. And, um, uh, you know, so, so when, you, when you consume omega-6 fats to excess, let me start by saying they're, they're pro-oxidative. And um, now that's a, there's a very long answer here, and I'll, and, and I'll try to just make this brief. Let me just interrupt you real quick for one second. Sure. It causes the LDL to become oxidized, and then we have the macrophages, and that's what sets us up for the, the macrophages become foam cells, and that's what sets us up for, you know, for, uh, for plaque to be released. And if you could kind of explain a little bit about that process, because it's it's a little confusing, but once you explain it, it kind of makes a lot of sense. Yeah, sure. So, um, so if we go back to coronary heart disease, we'll try to answer that, Carrie. So, in the in the nineteenth century, 
we know that coronary heart disease was just virtually unknown. There was, I um, think, not, uh, eight or nine papers uh, in the entire century uh, uh, that uh, regarding coronary heart disease and coronary heart disease with with a thrombus, meaning a myocardial infarction or heart attack. There was, I think, two or three papers. There was two papers for sure, possibly three, in the 19th century that reviewed that. So, and in other words, I'm just saying. Coronary heart disease was unknown when vegetable oils were unknown or very, very low consumption in, in, in the entire 19th century. So, and, and so today, you know, we know that coronary heart disease is the leading cause of death in the U.S. It accounts for a third of all deaths. It is the leading cause of death in the world. So how did we go from, I think it's like, like today, we, I mean, the, in, now we, something like 18 or 19 million people die per year from coronary heart disease in the world. So how do we go from you know, all zero essentially in 19th century to that many? And the answer is, is the, the, the short answer is, is that it's primarily vegetable oils with processed foods being a secondary component. Why? Because uh, very simply put, uh, L, you know, we, we've, we've vilified LDL cholesterol for a long time for the cause of heart disease, but LDL, will not cause atherosclerosis unless the LDL is oxidized. So when the LDL becomes oxidized, then it, can, it will be uh, taken up out of the circulation through the, the vascular endothelium into the intima and begin an atherosclerotic plaque. And, that, and, and then as you mentioned, become foam cells. Those will in, enlarge. And this is what causes atherosclerotic narrowing. And, but here's the thing is the primary reason that the LDL oxidizes is because when you consume high omega-6 seed oils in your, in your diet, you accumulate omega-6 linoleic acid in the LDL. And that, that, that linoleic acid, that LA, it oxidizes in the LDL. And we know that the components that define oxidized LDL are breakdown products. They're metabolic end products of oxidized LDL. And these are things like nine, nine and 13 HODE, which is the, that's hydroxy octadeca dianoic acid and malondialdehyde, MDA. Those are the three chemical components that define oxidized LDL. And this is what we know is that you have to have uh, oxidation of LDL for LDL to be taken up into the end endothelium and, and begin uh, atherosclerotic plaques. Well, we're speaking with Dr. Chris Kenobi, the author of The Ancestral Diet Revolution. Uh, when we get back, we're going to talk about how we could avoid vegetable oils. And is it our fault? We'll be right back. The All Eyes Visual Oil VRP is a portable vision testing platform that includes visual fields acuity, color vision testing, pupillometry, and extraocular motility. The visual leverages virtual reality, artificial intelligence, and augmented technologies to enable eye care providers to test for and monitor common eye diseases. Visit alleyes.com for more information. To get your copy of Dr. Chris Kenobi's book, The Ancestral Diet Revolution, How Vegetable Oils and Processed Foods Destroy Our Health, and how to recover, go to amazon.com and learn how to prevent, treat, and often reverse most chronic diseases, including obesity, heart disease, cancer, metabolic syndrome, diabetes, Alzheimer's, macular degeneration, autoimmune disease, anxiety, depression, and much, much more with natural ancestral diets. MacuHealth, your science-born and tested solutions for visual performance, macular degeneration, and dry eye syndrome. New products coming soon. Embrace the science. We're back with Dr. Chris Kenobi, ophthalmologist, researcher, scientist, nutrition researcher, the modern day Weston Price. And we're going to talk about Weston Price. Uh, so we're talking about the dangers of these vegetable oils. So I want to ask Chris, is it our fault that we're eating all these vegetable oils? Oh, no, absolutely not. In fact, um, we have been told to eat these, uh, to eat vegetable oils since 1960 or 61 uh, is when the American Heart Association um, came forward without any scientific evidence at all 
uh, recommending that we consume vegetable oils. And, uh, and the reason that they did is because it is known that vegetable oils drive LDL, which was the pur purported cause of coronary heart disease. Uh, they, it, you know, we know that vegetable oils tend to drive LDL down. Uh, and again, the reason they do is because they oxidize the LDL, and then the LDL is, ta is, is taken up out of the circulation, as we talked about. But if we go clear back to the 19th century, when so cottonseed oil was the first uh, seed oil introduced uh, uh, t in the United States, uh, and uh, Americans did not want a vegetable oil um, because they knew at that time, they knew that cottonseed oil had only been used really as lamp oil uh, and machine oil and then and then in fertilizer and they used it in cattle feed but the, uh, Americans did not believe this was uh, this was something they should be eating in fact and so and so but the manufacturers were they were not deterred by this they decided the best way to get it into the food supply then was to begin to adulterate lard and butter and that is exactly what they began to do and they and the, perhaps the first thing they did or the second thing they did was to um, adulterate uh, olive oil and so we were sending adulterated olive oil um, for example to uh, to to Europe in and uh, France made complaint about that in 1880 um, but but it, but anyway so so they they just continue to push forward with this, you know, this, the, the belief system that these oils could be, could be uh, put into the food supply and that they were okay to eat. In other words, they, you know, they probably wouldn't cause harm to people. And I do believe that, you know, this was not necessarily malicious, but it was just, you know, born out of a, a desire to, to, to produce an income. And so they, with vegetable oils, they could undersell lard and butter. And that's exactly what they did. And that's how they ended up replacing lard and butter, essentially, with vegetable oils. And that's what happened over the 20th century. So if you just, I'll mention just one statistic here. So in 1900, 99% um, of the added fats in the diet came from animal fat, lard, butter, and beef tallow. Right. And so, but by 2005, 86% of the added fats in the diet came from vegetable oils. And so we have, in terms of added fats, we've almost completely supplanted and replaced the healthy traditional animal fats with vegetable oils. So and question, along with that came all this chronic disease. So the question is, how about olive oil? Is olive oil healthy? Yeah, so it's a it's a, a easy question and a, a fairly complex answer, but I'll simplify as much as I can, carry. So first of all, I want to say now we've all, everybody listening already has heard that we want to have low omega six um, in our diet, and that primarily comes from consuming uh, animal fats, and you can consume very low omega six uh, via the the uh, tropical oils. Um, palm or palm i should just say coconut and palm kernel those are the really low two percent omega-6 linoleic acid in comparison olive oil is about 10 percent omega-6 linoleic acid la um, that's an average but in a study of over 800 types of olive oil the omega-6 ran the gamut from around three percent to about 22 percent omega-6 linoleic acid all right, that's a big range. So you don't know what you're getting, number one. Number two is, is that um, if in the United States, and this may be true around the world, a whole lot of the olive oil, around 79%, is, does not meet uh, the criteria for a good quality extra virgin olive oil, according to the North American Olive Oil Association, the NAOOA, I believe that is. And this is because... These oils have either been adulterated with the cheap omega-6 oils like soybean or canola, um, or they are uh, dated, they're old, they're, uh, they, they've taken a, a long journey and being transported to the U.S. 
for example, and they've been in the bottle a long time and they, they are oxidized. So I personally think that if you're going to consume olive oil, um, number one, know that it is not as healthy in, in my belief system as uh, butter. And uh, it cannot begin to compare with the omega-6 linoleic acid of butter. And um, if you're going to consume it, you, you better be sure that you absolutely confirm that you're getting true, authentic olive oil, that it is extra virgin. Uh, it means cold pressed. And how can, that, we, how, can we, how can we know that we are getting that, the, the, the good olive oil? Is there a way? Is there a rating? Uh on the olive oil, is there a website that you might know of? So we know whether we're getting good olive oil. But we yeah. olive oil that's 2% LA, which we know LA is the bad, we want to stay away from LA for the people listening. So it's 2% LA uh, rather than the, the ones that are cut with canola oil or soybean oil and, uh, and could be as high as 20%. And that's what we want to try to avoid. Right. So I think the uh, the the North American Olive Oil Association ha has a if I recall right that they have a, a listing of the oils. Um, I, I think it would th th that are that we you know would meet their criteria of certification as good quality olive oils. Another way to know really is, is if you live anywhere near uh, a, a an olive oil producer, you can actually go there and uh and confirm that that these oils are fresh cold pressed uh and authentic um so i i think that's the best way to know and what should what should we be cooking you mentioned it before butter beef tallow uh but what should we be cooking with yeah i don't think we should cook with any oil unless it's coconut or, or possibly palm kernel but but um, I think we should cook in animal fat. And I, for, for me, I think the simplest thing and the easiest thing to get everywhere today is butter. Um, you, you know it's going to be good quality. I would look for a grass, 100% grass-fed butter, so from pastured cattle. Um, and, um, uh, you know, it, it's, it's safe to cook with, and you know that the linoleic acid is low. And you will get the vitamins A, D, and K2 uh, to, to, you know, to some degrees from butter, whereas none of the vegetable oils, even the, the good quality ones like olive oil, coconut, or palm kernel, they do not have any uh, fat-soluble vitamins A, D, and K2 in those at all. Not, not a single uh, plant source provides those vitamins, and those vitamins are critical to our nutrition and to our health. And what's the difference between beef tallow and lard? And can you use that to cook? I mean, you could go online, you could buy beef tallow. You might be able to save it if you're making, if you have grass-fed steak, and you could save some of the some of the uh, the beef the beef oils. Uh, uh, what's your opinion on uh, using that to cook uh, lard or beef tallow? Yeah. So let me start with beef tallow. So so uh, because. Uh, cattle are ruminants. They have a they have a fermentation chamber in their gut. Um, everybody knows that they have multiple stomachs, right? And so that fermentation chamber in in the guts of ruminants like like beef, cattle, um, they that that stomach actually biohydrogenates omega six into monounsaturated and saturated fats. So even if you feed cattle corn and soy, which would which is high in uh, LA, they will not have high LA in their fat. It'll remain very low because of the fact that they high, can hydrogenate those unsaturated fats, the omega six, into saturated monounsaturated fats. So even if you're if you're consuming tallow that comes from cattle that are raised in a CAFO, a concentrated animal feeding operation, and fed GMO corn and soy, the omega-6 will be low. I wouldn't recommend that if you can avoid it. You want, I, I would try to get uh, beef that comes from cattle that are 100% raised on grass and never fed GMO corn and soy. Now, let me contrast that because you ask about lard. 
Now, lard, what you would think is, it's not all the same. And the reason it's not the same in terms of the fat is because monogastric animals, single stomach animals, which would include pigs, chickens, and humans, we do not have a biohydrogenation chamber to, to convert omega-6 into saturated monounsaturated fats. And so and when chickens and pigs are fed corn and soy, which are high omega-6, they will accumulate the omega-6 in their body fat and up to around 20% omega-6 in their body fat. And if you consume those foods and those fats, that's again, that's about the equivalent of consuming can canola oil in, in terms of the omega-6. So this is another hazard in our food supply. You can't, if you just avoid the omega-6 oils, huge benefit, enormous benefit. But then the next step is, is avoid the animals that are consuming corn and soy. The chicken, it really be best to, to avoid all of them, but especially the chicken and pork. You want to try to get ancestrally raised chicken and pork as well. And by the way, those studies have been done in terms of the omega-6 in those animals, and they are two to two and a half percent in the pork and chicken. To get your copy of Dr. Chris Kenobi's book, The Ancestral Diet Revolution, how vegetable oils and processed foods destroy our health and how to recover, go to amazon.com and learn how to prevent, treat, and often reverse most chronic diseases, including obesity, heart disease, cancer, metabolic syndrome, diabetes, Alzheimer's, macular degeneration, autoimmune disease, anxiety, depression, and much, much more with natural ancestral diets. All the agencies like the American Heart Association, American Heart Association tells us we should be eating uh, vegetable oil, and that's going to lower our cholesterol. But that doesn't work too good, does it, Chris? Well, it doesn't work in terms of our health. It's absolutely the worst possible thing we can do. So the American Heart Association's advice for us to consume high uh, omega-6 linoleic acid uh, rich vegetable oils, um, I think this is the, the, the worst possible advice we've ever been given about food. And I think it'll go down in history that way. You know, and they keep doubling down to eat vegetable oil, but things keep getting worse. They're not getting any better. You would think eventually it would start getting better if it would work. Right. It, you know, it, it just, it, it's absolutely uh, mind boggling and insane that these organizations that I, I hate to say it, but include some of our most prestigious nutrition organizations like um, Harvard, uh, the nutrition department at Mayo Clinic, the nutrition department at Tufts, University, um, they're all telling us to consume these omega-6 rich uh, uh, vegetable oils. And the only reason they do this, Carrie, is because they do know that these oils can uh, lower your LDL uh, cholesterol. And uh, this is not a good thing. This is the most dangerous thing you could possibly do to yourself. And the evidence to me is just overwhelmingly clear that this is the case it lowers ldl but it oxidizes it so it makes it dangerous absolutely yeah it's this 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 there's a way of measuring la uh by looking at h and e because la breaks down linoleic acid which is the dangerous part of that we're talking about that comes from the vegetable oils breaks down into h and e and H and E is a biomarker specifically for linoleic acid, and that's a good way to study it. So talk about, about this, uh, this advanced lipid oxidation, uh, H and E, and what it does to our body. All right, so um, I, I'll, I'll keep this at the broad view of these. So when we consume omega-6 linoleic acid, one of the things that happens is that um, your, your body is always producing uh, reactive oxygen species. And these are hydroxyl radicals, singlet oxygen, superoxide radicals, and hydrogen peroxide. These are constantly being produced. And just the hydroxyl radicals, which is the most common one, we, a typical man would produce something like 1 times 10 to the 21st 
hydroxyl radicals in a day. This is a staggering number, all right? And so when you consume the, L, the, the omega-6, this is these are the most likely lipids to oxidize because of the uh, because they're unsaturated and they have uh, the the uh, that that means that they have an electron that can be uh, oxidized can be um, can be lost all right <laughs> and um, so but when you consume these these radicals will react with the LA and it will produce. Um, a lipid hydroperoxide. And the lipid hydroperoxide then is a very short-lived molecule and it will break down into what are called advanced lipid oxidation end products or ALES, A-L-E-S. And these are chem uh, chemicals like 4-hydroxynonenol, 4-H-N-E, malondialdehyde, MDA, carboxyethylpyrrole, um, and acrolein, and now th these are the named ones, but there's literally hundreds of these different uh, advanced lipid oxidation end products, these ales. And uh, I tell people this is a lot like smoking cigarettes, that when you smoke, you know, you take uh, tobacco and you smoke it, you, you, you burn it, and you produce over 6,000 chemicals, which is carcinogens and mutagens and all that. Well, it's the same thing when you consume omega 6 oils. Uh, rich omega-6 rich oils is that they break down into these ales and these ales, uh, 4-H&E, MDA, carboxyethylpyrrol, acrolein, these are all ultimately, these are um, uh, carcinogenic, uh, atherogenic, thrombogenic, obesogenic, diabetogenic chemicals. And these are highly destructive to our bodies. And you're right, we tend to, we can accumulate these, these, these molecules like 4-HNE, these can accumulate in our body along with the LA, or it's just that maybe the LA is constantly producing more of it. And we know that these rise in our body fat over in our, our cellular membranes over our lifetimes. But there are people that have very low H&E and people that have very high H&E. Again, which is a testament to the fact that there are people that don't consume any oils and there are people that consume massive amounts of oils. So we have to avoid those. In your book, you made a great point. There was a professor from uh, Japan and he did some research and he shows as you eating these oils, these um, safflower, sunflower, uh, peanut oil, all the, the, the uh, canola oil, all these omega-6 oils that are dangerous, as you eat them, as you get older, you get it, it, you, it actually accumulates in your body faster the older you get. So, uh, so if you're 80 and you're eating these oils as opposed to your eight, you're doubling the rate at which it's accumulating in your body and making it much more dangerous for you because it's associated, like you said, with stroke and Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, diabetes, and even you know, for us as eye doctors, uh, macular degeneration and 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 potential blindness. But the body wants to get rid of these things. So one of the ways the body can get rid of it is with exercise. And you had this magic uh, way of getting rid of it that's that's in uh, that's in that's in beef from cattle, carnosine. Tell us how carnosine is comes to the rescue. Yeah, so it's it's pretty interesting that you know the the fact that these um, these advanced lipid oxidation end products are very very dangerous. There is at least you know there there's at least one major mechanism that helps to prevent the damage and it, it is carnosine and it is a sacrificial sink for uh, a, a, advanced lipid oxidation end products and uh, ages, advanced uh, uh, the uh, glycemic a, uh, end products. And, uh, and that, so that's carnosine, which comes from animal meat. So animal meat may actually help to, uh, to prevent the damage that you get from consuming vegetable oils. So I would submit that, you know, perhaps one of the most dangerous things to do would be to consume a diet that's high in vegetable oils and very low in meat. That would put you in the danger zone. And you're right, you know, our bodies, we, we're meant to consume, you know, 
a, a very, very low level of omega-6 linoleic acid. Um, it, it should be under 2% of our calories and not 10 to 12% or beyond 12%, which is about where we are today in the, in the United States. Um, and so, it, you, but there are ways to help uh, prevent the damage. And yes, it would be like, just as you said, Carrie, I think, you know, we can burn the omega-6s for fuel. So exercise is going to help, but you got to get rid of them. You got to get them out of your diet. Um, and then a nutrient rich diet, which would include um, animal meat, um, uh, probably especially beef and uh, good quality uh, uh, fat soluble vitamins, which would also come from the animal meat. So a, I'm talking about AD and K2 here. So those, those would help to, the, 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 those would all help to prevent the damage of vegetable oils. You know, I'm going to ask you this and real quickly, do you recommend taking carnacy supplements? I really do not, Carrie. I try to, as much as possible, I try to get all of my nutrition through food. I used to be a believer that we could do that entirely, but I'll, I'll tell you, this is not in the book, but I believe that it's, it's very, very difficult to get all of your minerals from our food supply. And... Uh, and, and so we need to, we may need to supplement those. So we're talking with Dr. Chris Kenobi, the author of The Ancestral Diet Revolution. As we wrap up part one of our show, I just wanna thank all the audience for watching it. This is Open Your Eyes Radio on AM 1280, The Patriot. Uh, we also have our podcast every Monday. Uh, you could view our podcast online, wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, from we also have the open your eyes documentary on amazon prime apple tv youtube uh, movies and shows this is open your eyes radio on am 1280 the patriot i'm dr kerry gelb and next week we're going to talk to chris and he's going to tell us about his 10 rules how to be healthy so i'm going to be looking forward to that dr kenobi thank you for joining me today and we'll be back with you next week Your eyes and your vision are under attack, damaging blue light from the sun. Your phone, your computer, your tablet, even light bulbs and car headlights is constantly bombarding you. The good news is our eyes actually already have a line of defense to counter the effects of blue light. This defense is made up of three pigments called carotenoids. MacU Health with Micromicell, the only supplement with the exclusive patent on all three macular carotenoids and micromicell technology. The All Eyes Visual VRP is a portable vision testing platform that includes visual fields, acuity, color vision testing, pupillometry, and extraocular motility. The visual leverages virtual reality, artificial intelligence, and augmented technologies to enable eye care providers to test for and monitor common eye diseases. Visit alleyes.com for more information. Fitting multifocal contact lenses presents a big opportunity to meet patient needs while growing your practice. Alcon is your partner, not only with our innovative portfolio, but through e-learning. Learn to enhance your multifocal strategy today with the Alcon Experience Academy. OIE Broadcasting is the emerging leader in social media. We use scientific entertainment to drive more patients into your office. Visit OIEbroadcasting.com and sign up today. Since I bought Safe For You, my dad makes me clean his boat. It's natural y es un buen producto. Every time I go back to school, my mom always makes sure that I have my Safe For You products. I bring extra and my roommates certainly don't mind. It's a good thing I had Safe For You to clean up after this little guy. When my hands get dry, I like to wash them with Safe For You. And most importantly, the reason why I buy Safe For You is because it's safe for me and you.